We'd now like to welcome Hans Klevers and Candace Henley, who will introduce us to work package number four, uh, which is all about learning from model systems, transforming the microbiome to impact uh, cancer risk. Hans is a professor in molecular genetics at Utrecht University in the Netherlands since 1991. He also runs his lab in the Hubrecht Institute. Throughout his career, he has worked on the role of WNT signaling in stem cells in cancer. Candace is a 14-year colon cancer survivor who works to help others make sense of the disease. She is prolific in telling her story of a very challenging battle that inspires others to never give up. She is also a very accomplished foundation executive director with significant experience in community outreach and patient education. I was intrigued in reading about this session when I read particularly at both hands and uh, Candace will be discussing model systems or what are called mini colons grown in the laboratory to explore how differences in the composition of the microbiome uh, may influence the development and outcomes of colorectal cancer. Welcome everybody to understanding the clinical impact of modulating the colon cancer microbiome. I'm pleased to have Dr. Hans Cleavers with us and Candace Hainley from uh, Blue Hat Foundation. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about model systems to study the colorectal cancer microbiome. What is the goal of your project? Yeah. Hi, Barry. Hi, Candice. Yeah, so uh, so it's, it's a bit of a complicated science story. We'll keep it simple. It will be a brief lecture. So what, what we invented about 15 years ago is a method to take any piece of, uh, of the human body, of, uh, of a donor, of an individual, you know, a healthy volunteer, tiny piece of tissue cells, uh, maybe one millimeter in diameter, and we can put it in a plastic dish and then we can coerce it to start growing and form, much to our surprise then, form a mini version of the organ where you got the cells from. So this works best for the colon, for the large intestine, which is the subject of uh, WP4, uh, work package four. And, um, and this allows us to rather than use animals, for instance, experimental animals, to really use a, a, a mini version of a human organ to do real experiments. And uh, the question that we address, you know, the group of people that make up this work package is the following. Um, it has been shown in the past few years that patients with colon cancer have a different makeup of their microbiome. So the microbiome are all the bacteria in your colon, many, many different species. Uh, still, uh, every year, new species are being discovered. Uh, we almost know nothing about these bacteria. And also because there are so many, they work together, very difficult to investigate. And almost everything we know is done by so-called association. So what you can do is see what kind of bacterial species do you see in a healthy individual's colon? Do you see other species or different ratios in patients with colon cancer? And you can say, okay, for instance, Fusobacterium that you just mentioned is clearly people with colon cancer tend to have many more of these bacteria, particularly on the cancers. Now that sort of suggests that they cause the cancer but we don't know. They might be a consequence of the cancer. It might be that once a cancer has formed, that these bacteria come in and just like the environment of, uh, of a tumor tissue. Uh, and they are not really uh, the cause of that tumor tissue. Now, um, does so... The, does the, uh, the, sorry to interrupt, but and yeah. does the, um, the bacterium follow um, the cancer when it metastasizes to other organs? There is some evidence that indeed that fusobacterium and some others will travel with these. So they really are closely associated. So they like each other, the cancer cell and these bacteria. And they can, there are suggestions, it's not definitive, definitively proven, that they can travel with cells that are metastasizing, say to the liver or somewhere else, where typically colon cancer cells will go, and then and then colonize a distant site in the patient's body. Yeah, that still doesn't prove that they cause the cancer or that they even affect the cancer, but it's a good starting point. So what we can now do, in because we have these tiny, these mini colons of healthy individuals or of colon cancer patients in a dish, 
we can actually add these bacteria and see if anything happens. And um, yeah, if you allow me, you can, we, we had, I think, a quite a spectacular study uh, uh, a few years ago, two years ago, published from this, from this consortium. And uh, I should also stress maybe there's only one bacterium known currently that is causative to cancer. And that's Helicobacter that causes stomach cancer. That's very well established, Nobel Prize. People get treated, the bacteria get removed, and that, that basically takes the risk for, for stomach cancer away. But that's the only bacterium where there's a clear cause and effect relationship between the presence of the bacterium and getting the cancer. Now, there's three, four, five candidates in colon that could do the same thing. And um, so we, we investigated one, which is a very common, actually the, the, the best known and the longest known bacterium in the colon of, of humans called E. coli. E. coli stands for from the colon. This bacterium has been known for a hundred years. Now, what we now know is there is this, not just one bacterium. There is a whole group of related bacteria that we collectively call E. coli, but there's some, some ones that are okay. There are some that can make you very sick. It can kill you, can cause all sorts of pneumonias. And, uh, and there is one one that causes DNA damage. So it, it, it harms the DNA of the, of the host cell. So if they are in the colon, they would harm the DNA of colon. And if you harm the DNA, the DNA needs to be repaired and that can lead to mutations in DNA. And uh, so, and if you have mutations in your DNA, that is the way to become a cancer cell. So a cancer cell, the difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell is that the cancer cell has mutations in the DNA and a very specific mutation that make the cell grow faster and metastasize and do these bad things. Now, we, we showed, to cut a long story short, by taking these, this, this putatively bad version of E. coli that we got from a collaborator in France, we injected it into a mini colon in a dish. So we didn't use any animals. We just used healthy, normal cells in the form of a mini colon. We let them sit there for a few weeks, and then we analyzed the DNA of the... Uh, of the bacteria, of, sorry, of the of the of the mini colon, and we found indeed that this bacterium causes mutations. So it's called mutagenic, and mutagenic substances are generally carcinogenic, so they cause cancer. And then we could go on to show that actually the types of mutations that we be induced very artificially in the lab. If you now go to a large cohort, four or five thousand cancer patients, you only see these particular mutations in patients with colon cancer. You don't see them in breast cancer, you don't see them in skin cancer. And that's, we think, good evidence that indeed, not only in the lab are these bacteria dangerous, this particular version of E. coli, but also um, in real patients, we estimate about 15% of colon, colon cancer patients show evidence that this bacterium has, has damaged their DNA and caused mutations in their DNA. So that's very causative for colon cancer. And I guess that's very important to know, not only in how to treat it, but also on how to prevent it. But you're also using antibiotics to potentially decrease uh, colon cancer, or at least the bacterium within the uh, colon. Could you explain a little bit about that and how that might uh, impact yeah. future, future generations in treating uh, colon cancer? Yeah, sure. So, so going back to the stomach cancer example, so Helicobacter, the bacterium that causes stomach ulcers and eventually stomach cancer, if you're a carrier of that bacterium, you are at risk. What your doctor does as soon as he finds out that uh, or she finds out that you carry this bacterium in your stomach, you get treated with antibiotics that kill Helicobacter. It's pretty. It's not an easy bacterium to kill, but the treatment works well. So we're, we're trying to confirm what we have found in the lab further. If that holds up, the next step is not so difficult. This, this bacterium is quite easily killed by antibiotics. You can quite easily remove it, much like what is, what's being done currently already for stomach cancers and helicobacter. Candice, you've been working on this, on this project and work package uh, for with Dr. Cleavers and his team. And uh, of course, it's very interesting, a little bit uh, on the technical side, perhaps. But I'm wondering how, and I know that you have, uh, provided input and engaged with uh, uh, the Cleaver's lab and uh, during this research. And what is it, what has impacted you about the research as well? Well, uh, being a survivor um, and someone who is curious, you know, of early age onset, right? And, and curious as to how, you know, this impacts us and, and, you know, how did I get this? I mean, you know, how this you know, affects, you know, future wise. And, and it just so happened that um, a couple of years ago, um, I had uh, surgery 
and being a part of the team and I had three different bacteria strains that were killing me pretty much. They were literally killing me. And they were, the doctors were in a rush trying to figure out what bacteria, you know, I had in three abscesses in my abdomen after the surgery. And if it had not been for me being a part of this package, I wouldn't have understood what they were talking about. So this helped me have the conversation and understand what the doctors were telling me about the different strain bacteria strains that they were trying to test and how long it was going to take, you know, for the, you know, for them to grow the bacteria so they can determine which antibi you know, antibiotics would work on which bacteria. This was helpful um, in, in, in my own personal journey and then and sharing my personal journey with the team and explaining how there's some information is technical, right? And so we have a responsibility to say, let's make, let's, let's translate this so that it's understandable, you know, for the patient community that's going to be looking at this and that's interested about it. Because if, if it's too technical, you know, and of course it should be, right? Because I mean, we have a lot of, you know, great people working on this and, and they're working in their you know, in their area. But for us as patients, we have a responsibility to say, this is great. Can we change the language so that the patients that are not academically inclined can understand what it is that you're talking about? And Dr. Cleavers, how do you find that um, researchers in your lab and yourself may have benefited from working together with Candace and, and other researchers? Has it changed their perspective in their in their day-to-day -day work? Yeah, so so I've been in this in this uh, uh, job for about 30, 35 years. And uh, so 30 years ago, there were no patient advocates. We basically investigated what we found interesting. And then of, of often we get carried away by what we're doing. And so so I, I do have an MD training. But after I, uh, I uh, specialized, I basically never seen a patient. But I at least understand, you know, the, the, the world of patients. Almost everybody in my lab is not an MD. And um, and so, as I already used the term carried away, but that what happens a lot. So we find something interesting, and rather than using that information to see how can we now translate this now to help a patient now, we are getting interested in the scientific problem, and we go deeper and deeper and deeper, and we make all these fantastic discoveries and breakthroughs, but they do not help the patient. So that's what I in this consortium. But if I've you know, I've seen patient advocates becoming important for the past 10, 15 years, I think uh, they always keep us in, in Dutch. You say you, they keep us uh, at the lesson, meaning you get focused on what you were intended to do and not on what you happen to to stumble across and then and then try to follow up. So uh, and particularly for my non MD scientists, they find it extremely interesting to actually see or get explained the link between what they're doing with all the technologies in the lab that's very far from a hospital bed and, uh, and a patient. And then hearing a patient talk about the other side of of, you know, of the technology once it works. I don't know if you would agree, Candice, but that's sort of uh, the, the, the scientist experience here. Yeah, and I always say I'm the product of your research because so often, you know, if you're not patient facing, you don't really see what, you know, what your research looks like in real time. You see what it looks like in data. And so I'm, I'm always saying I am grateful to be a part of this because someone researched the surgery I had, someone researched the treatment I had. And so because of that, I'm here today. And so this is what, you know, and I'm always saying data, 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 that's great. But data doesn't reflect the faces of the people that you've helped save. And so this for me is an opportunity to say, I'm here to say thank you for the work that you've done. And, you know, however I can, you know, con continue to use my position to help you help others, then that's what, you know, that's why I'm here because someone has to stand in the gap, right? And, you know, and I feel that this is, a small price to pay for, you know, the space that I'm, I'm, I'm operating it. And so this is an opportunity for me to give back and to, uh, and, and again, say thank you for all of the hard work that goes into saving those of us that were diagnosed with colorectal cancer, and especially those of us that are diagnosed with colon cancer at an early age. You know, we, we're still trying to figure out why it's happening. So this is important. That's great. Um, you know, here's a little bit of a bonus question. And will it impact um, uh, the immune system and various treatments for colorectal cancer? Yeah, I guess you're asking me the question. Yeah. So um, 
Well, a few thoughts. First of all, there, there are quite a few papers now indicating that the makeup of your microbiomes, all the different bacteria that you as a patient happen to have, you know, you yourself differs from any other patient, will actually affect the uh, the uh, immune oncology treatment that is nowadays often given to to patients, also to some colon cancer patients. So, uh, so it so your bacteria in your gut can dictate if your drug will or will not work. So that already makes it very important to read out what kind of bacteria do you have in your in your gut, and is this the favorable uh, composition of the microbiome, or is this the unfavorable? So that's one reason already to use it. Another reason to look at the bacteria would be even if they would not be causative, like Fusobacterium is still, we don't know. Maybe it causes, maybe it causes metastasis, as you suggest. Uh, maybe it's just there because it likes the environment of, uh, of a diseased colon. Um, but people also now are trying to see if, if screening the bacteria in your gut is an early indicator of a very small tumor so that you actually can find tumors like we now have the FIT test. Uh, which is essentially uh, uh, blood in the uh, human blood. So because adenomas often le uh, lose some blood, but maybe bacteria can already earlier indicate there's a tiny little tumor there. The bacteria already know it. They change the composition of the microbiome and that you can detect. And there's also indications that works. So even if, if the change is not causative to cancer, you can use it for very early diagnostics, which becomes more and more important in colon cancer now that, that the age of onset is, is getting lower and lower in the Western world. Uh, and then, of course, ultimately, if it happens to be a bacterium that is causative to colon cancer, then you also want to know who has it and wipe it out, as we already discussed. So there's, there's different ways of using this information. Uh, all of them are going to be important to patients. Because there's something special about our consortium that, you know, that, that, puts the, that, that does all this research, which is it's transatlantic. And that, that is, I, I have, I know very, very few occasions where this is possible. And that's because of CRUK, the charity, who I think is behind yeah. a lot of the, the good cancer care and cancer research in, in Britain. Now there is actually one entity that, that basically picked us as a team and said, okay, you go ahead. They review us. Uh, 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 Candice has been there as well. Uh, Laura has been there. They review us and they encourage us to go in different ways. And this is this is rather unique, which I think I, I'd like to recognize here. It's really remarkable. So thank you both for participating in this uh, webinar today. Thanks, Candice. Thanks, Barry. Thank you both, uh, Hans and Con Candice, uh, for, uh, and of course, Barry, for uh, facilitating that session. I, I, I am still fascinated by what I call the mini colons in a dish and the, the absolute amount of research and study that that allows. Um, Hans and Candace raised this, this concept of work being done by the team to fill the gap between data-driven research and the hospital bed, which I think has been a fundamental theme as part of all of the webinars that we've seen today. The idea that researchers with the engagement of patients are being asked to focus on the lesson, to not be distracted from, from, from the task at hand. And as Candace said, she's the product of the research. So that coming together is this bridge between data-driven research and the hospital bed, which was the uh, theme that's been, uh, or, or the conversation that was had uh, as part of this webinar.